I'm reading from page 17 until the end of the introduction for white reconstruction. Critical methods for the millennium of man. Thus far, I have attempted to build a conceptualization of white reconstruction as a historically pervasive logic of reform, rearticulation, adaptation, and revitalization that periodically surges into the aspirational hemispheric to global projects of white being, such as civilization, manifest destiny, civil rights progress and desegregation, and so on. Considered in the context of the recent and ongoing half century, White Reconstruction references a specific mobilization of institutional rhetorics, cultural and discursive regimes, political juridical strategies, and militarized racial statecraft that, number one, sustain anti-black and racial colonial domestic war as the condition of racial capitalism and the U.S. social formation, and two, constitute a political and cultural field of distinctly post-apartheid struggles for hegemony that are strategically, unevenly, and inconsistently inclusionist, diversity-directed, and or multiculturalist in form. These post-apartheid struggles for hegemony are significant in their newness, largely because they are waged on or in proximity to the normative racial statecraft of liberal, desegregated racial colonial recognition, in which people historically targeted by formalized protocols of categorical alienation and exclusion from the racial chattel, settler state, are non-consensually subjected to the novel and constantly changing mandates, processes, and compulsory rituals of pluralist inclusion and accommodation into proper national personhood. Citizenship. Glenn Coulthard, parentheses, Yellow Knives Dean, or Denny, and parentheses, crystallizes the centrality of liberal recognition to indigenous people's exposures to the post 1980s iterations of the Canadian nation state. Quote, Instead of ushering in an era of peaceful coexistence grounded on the ideal of reciprocity or mutual recognition, the politics of recognition in its contemporary liberal form promises to reproduce the very configurations of colonialist, racist, and patriarchal state power that indigenous peoples' demands for recognition have historically sought to transcend. For Coulthard, the pageantry and public exercises of liberal recognition, for example, voting rights, formal equality under the law, citizenships, citizenship status, compulsory multiculturalism and diversity man mandates, state apologies, and or piecemeal financial redress for past atrocities, extend rather than replace, repair, or even mitigate the ensemble of state and cultural practices that sustain colonial occupation and war as Canada's condition of national coherence and sovereignty. The implications of this critique are vast. The invasive premises of the liberal extension of politicality and full sociality permanently delineate, disrupt, and redefine the structures and discursive regimes of citizenship, freedom, bodily integrity, and personhood as they are contingently assessed by the non-normative, non non-subjects, and targets of the anti-black, racial colonial settler state. In this context, criminal law, policing, electoral politics, border militarization, corporate media, carceral schools, foundation and think tank funded academic research agendas, prisons, jails, reservations, detention centers, and other such institutions signify the relations of coercive power that overdetermine white reconstruction struggles over hegemony. Parentheses as a mediated, non-coercive power of consent." End parentheses. Put differently, the cultural-political terrain of White Reconstruction's particular form of hegemonic struggle is distinctive because the conditions of anti-blackness, racial colonial coloniality, and domestic war are the precedents and foundations on which a logic of white multiculturalist solicitation 
anticipates the bodily presence and limited inclusion of human groups previously marginalized or excluded from the domain of political coalitions, historical blocks, and social subjectivities within the modern post-conquest, post-emancipation U.S. nation building project. The following chapters examine white reconstruction's ensemble of war, insurgency, consent, and solicitation through a combination of three analytical and methodological approaches. One approach entails symptomatic readings of specific historical moments, archival texts, and political cultural geographies within the contemporaneous ongoing half-century of white reconstruction's most recent and current re-emergence. This symptomatic method encompasses discursive analysis as well as informed, creative, and periodically speculative explication of the events, cultural productions, political formations, and inhabited places that contextualize the logics of white reconstruction in its moments and sites of enactment. How do the power formations of white reconstruction look, feel, and read in their instances of articulation? How can intensive analytical readings and re-narrations of such instances provide political intellectual tools for understanding the forms of anti-black and racial colonial power and dominance that constitute, rather than contradict or displace, the institutionalized narr narratives of the liberal, multiculturalist racist state at the same time that they galvanize multiculturalist white supremacist statecraft and populist white nationalist political nationalist political cultures. A second method methodological strategy involves a re-period periodization of the projected white multiculturalist subjects of white reconstruction. Most acutely, I am interested in cultivating a deeper understanding of how the ascendancy of white being is conceived, operationalized, periodically institutionalized, and violently defended amidst the formal desegregation of apartheid white institutionalities across multiple historical contexts. This form of engagement addresses the conceptual, ontological, and historical premises of white reconstruction through theorized re-narrations of prior, pre-1960s, archival moments in the entwined historical lives of anti-blackness, racial colonial violence, and ascendant white being. I argue that at the core value of protecting and sustaining white being's ascendancy not only defines the post-U.S. apartheid social formation, but also permeates the historical totality of white nation building and white supremacist globality. The interwoven regimes of liberal racial statecraft, white racial subject formation and ontological reassembly, and systematic state and extra state violence are some of the technologies of reconstruction that empower white being as an invasive aspiration to global universality, known as civilization. The third analytical and methodological approach of this book is generally aligned with Michael Foucault's notion of genealogy as a theorized historical tracing that, quote, dispenses with the con constituent subject to arrive at an analysis which can account for the constitution of the subject within a historical framework, end quote. Foucault de describes this method as a form of history which can account for the constitution of knowledges, discourses, domains of objects, etc., without having to make reference to a subject which is either transcendental in relation to the field of events, or runs in its empty sameness throughout the course of history. In critical dialogue with Foucault's framing, I conceptualize white reconstruction less as a discrete historical periodization than as a mobilized and militarized narrative structure that attempts to rearticulate, police, and pacify the violences, crises, and irreconcilable antagonisms of a post-apartheid, post-conquest society structured in dominance. The genealogical approach allows for rigorous analytical, narrative, and archival practices that are not restricted to traditional discipline, disciplinary knowledge forms and methodologies, 
for example, scientific empiricism, archival and archaeological object study, strict, differenti strict differentiation between primary and secondary texts, and so on. Further, a critical and capacious approach to genealogy allows for the crea creative and attentive consideration of every imaginable cultural political text, including those that might otherwise be deemed too mundane, ordinary, unrefined, or uninteresting to serve as focal points of scholar scholarly analysis and or critical knowledge making. Foucault argues for a counter-anti-disciplinary disposition in the production of an insurgent historical episteme, that is, a form of historical knowledge that displaces and demystifies official hegemonic histories. Quote, We can give the name genealogy to the coupling together of scholarly erudition and local memories which allows us to constitute a historical knowledge of struggles and to make use of that knowledge in contemporary tactics. Genealogies are not positivistic returns to a form of science that is more attentive or more accurate. Genealogies are, quite specifically, anti-sciences. Genealogy has to fight the power effects characteristic of any discourse that is regarded as scientific. Compared to the attempt to inscribe knowledges in the power hierarchy typical of science, genealogy is, then, a sort of attempt to desubjugate historical knowledges, to set them free, or, in other words, enable them to oppose and struggle against the coercion of unitary, formal, and scientific theoretical discourse. While I embrace Foucault's ap approach to genealogy, I qualify my appropriation of his method with a critical rejoinder. In this book, the work of archival explication is simultaneously engaged in a demystification and disruption of the presumed epistemological agent and subject, that is, the active knowledge producer of Foucaultian genealogy. What I have elsewhere referenced as the subject position of white academic raciality. As conceptualized here, white raciality is simultaneously an epochal, epochal? Hmm. disciplining knowledge project and a laboriously constructed ep epistemic subject position, fabricated as the essential bearer of and respondent to epistemology as such. As both an epistemological project and collective subjectivity, white raciality inhabits a position structured in global histories of systematic power and dominance, articulated through post-conquest and modern discourses of white, European, and Euro-American racial transparency. For Denise Ferreria da Silva, the transparency thesis is a narrative of ontology an epistemological agency that yields white raciality as the, quote, transparent I, a transcendent sub subject of history that is crystallized through violently universalized notions of man, and man is a proper noun, mankind, humanity, civilization, and human nature. Silva describes the transparent I as, quote, the representation of the subject historic Histor historicity presupposes and reproduces, which in its consti constitutive, gosh, that is inhabited white raciality emerges always already in a contentious contention with racial others that both institute and threaten its ontological prerogative. In transparency, the white racial being constantly produces, or fabricates, their own mastery over both the external force of the material natural world and the ontological, physiological differences signified by racial others. The narrow problem of white academic raciality surfaces in Foucault's genealogical method. As the unspoken assumpti assumptive age agential and mediating epistemic position that is prepared to engage and perhaps rescue, translate, or otherwise recuperate, quote, desubjugated and insurgent, end quote, knowledges.
White academic Ratiality assumes a posture of generally unquestioned authority both within the archival methodologies of the modern academic disciplines and against that regime of disciplinary hegemony in the production of critical, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, and counter antidisciplinary knowledges. For example, Foucault's and Nietzsche's, etc., genealogy. White academic raciality occupies the nexus of disciplinary, counterdisciplinary, and racial transparency as the veritable mono monopoly position for the making of proper knowledges as such. The genealogical method of this book reads white raciality against its self enunciations in white reconstruction, with special attention to its vindicating articulations of post apartheid white collective subjectivity and multiculturalist institutionality. This approach attempts to demystify the stranglehold of white, white academic raciality on the recognition and criti critical reproduction of archives and counter archives alike. What if white raciality, including its academic variations, was subjected to others' intrusive, disruptive, and epis epistemically destructive genealog gene genealogical narratives? What if it were? Of course, it is possible to trace how. Of course, it is possible to trace how people on the alienated margins of the civilization academic coalescence have always engaged in some version of this critical creative practice as a matter of cultural survival and interdisciplinary liberation praxis. The point is to breathe freely and think openly while performing that work, which by necessity must be experimentally rigorous and rigorously experimental. While white academic raciality occupies a virtual monopoly position in the institutionalization of official knowledge, it is both possible and necessary to form a genealogical method that actively displaces this long-standing white supremacist knowledge position. Ashton Crawley reminds us that the university has a primary site of epistemic and institutional, quote, struggle and contestation, end quote, accretes quote, settler colonial logics and logistics and anti-black racism, end quote. Thus, the university, quote, in its normative function and form, is against the flourishing of abundance, end quote. As I have tried to clarify elsewhere, white raciality is not reducible to white people, as it encompasses piecemeal inclusions of non-white racial others, and is also appropriated as a paradigm for power, rule, and knowledge making within the parameters of modern nation building. Nation building, identity formation, and cultural production. White raciality is adapted, appropriated, and oft tacitly naturalized by other beings as a template for proper, respectable human being. In the following chapters, I attempt to model a critical tracing of the long archival knowledge regime of white raciality that embraces a methodological commitment to the obsolescence of white academic raciality as such. Such an approach, I contend, can illuminate and facilitate the, quote, flourishing abundance, end quote, of thought, praxis, and being that Crawley invokes as an antithesis to the university's normative institutionality. This labor invites a wondrous possibility that Foucault obliquely invokes but cannot consummate in his vast body of work. White academic raciality gravitating, or push toward irrelevance, as its claims to transparency and epistemic essentiality are expunged by the unavoidably physiological, inherited modalities of knowing that are constituted across layered, overlapping epochs of gendered, racial colonial, and anti-black violence. Diane Millian, parentheses, Tadana Athabaskan, and parentheses, gestures to an indigenous feminist epistemy formed in and critically rigorously informed by gendered colonial violence, radically departing from rituals and knowledge production that replicate the assumptive authorship authority of white academic raciality. Quote, 
Indigenous women participate in creating new languages for communities to address the real, multi-layered facets of their histories, histories and concerns by insisting on the inclusion of our lived experience, rich with emotional knowledges of what pain and grief and hope meant or mean now in our pasts and futures. This is also to underline again the importance of felt experiences as community knowledges that interactively inform our positions as Native scholars, particularly as Native women scholars. Millian's thesis on knowledge formation is both anti-colonial, contributing to a displacement and destruction of white epistemic transparency, and decolonial, forming a presence forming a premise for liberated, self-determining indigenous life and knowledge. I privilege her account on its own terms while also recognizing its resonances with other political intellectual traditions that situate the conditions and substance of epistemology within an accumulated collective experiences, within accumulated collective experiences of flesh, body, spirit, ecology, and revolt against systematic oppressive violence. This book's conceptualizations, theoretical arguments, and methods are shaped by such radical traditions, including the anti-colonial and decolonializing feminist practice exemplified by Millian's work, the creative labors of Black, diasporic, feminist, and queer radicalism, contemporary, late 1990s to present, carceral and police, policing abolitionist praxis, anti-racist and radical liberationist movements, insurgencies and rebellions, and other forms of inter- inter- interdisciplinary, counterdisciplinary knowledge that annihilate the assum- assumptive epistemic ascendancy of white raciality. Traversing the, the Pelican Bay, California prison, prison hunger strike and Chicago's We Change Genocide, see chapters four to five, to Idle No More, the movement for Black Lives, Black Lives Matter, and the Standing Rock Water Protectors, hashtag no DAPL, as well as grassroots rebellions against anti-black police violence during and prior to summer 2020, there's no shortage of collective knowledges and cultural productions that repudiate the coercive glo- globality of white raciality. This collective genius enunciates the transformative possibilities already present in insurgent people's memories, art, and extra academic scholarship and un- undecolonized archives. Following Millian, such creative scholarly activist labors thrive in intimacy with rage, disgust, principled hatred, love of collective peoplehood, urgent desire for escape from freedom, systematic racialized premature death, and other effective and physiological modalities of knowing that are utterly common to people working within various traditions of radical, liberationist, and revolutionary praxis. David Lloyd argues that Since its inception in the late 18th century, aesthetic philosophy has functioned as a regulative discourse of the human on which the modern conception of the political and racial order of modernity rests. If the condition of the aesthetic, and thinking about aesthetics, coheres in the disciplinary and violent, that is, robustly regulative, relations of power, dominance, authorship, and authority that define the ascendancy of white being, then it is incumbent then it is incumbent on other beings to identify, creatively theorize, and re-narrate its textual body. Following Nicole Fleetwood's framing of Black aesthetic praxis as, quote, a performative field where seeing race is not tr- a transparent act, it is in self a doing, end quote, it becomes possible to both trace and radically confront the violence of ascendancy through insurgent re-inhabitations of the collective act of textual, visual, and cultural production. Here I am guided by Fleetwood's nuanced explication of blackness, the black body, and black life as, quote, always already troubling to the dominant white western visual field, end quote. A critical methodological and theoretical approach that places a vital emphasis on, quote, the productive possibilities of this figuration through specific cultural works and practices, end quote. 
One productive possibility of such an aesthetic, epistemic, and analytical, analytical centering of insurgent black being as the invigoration of an archival reading and narrative practice that demystifies and potentially obliterates white being as such. The, arch the archive of white raciality is particularly accessible and multidisciplinary, surfacing in U.S. Congressional Records, Chapter 2, Human Rights Jurisprudence, Chapter 4, Body Art, Chapter 3, and State Counterinsurgency Strategies, Chapters 1 and 5. As this archive surrounds and permeates the cultural structures of white Western modernity and the ongoing civilization project, I contend that the texts of white raciality can and must be subjected to purposeful, intellectually principled, and rigorous methods of disarticulation. Such a critically aggressive posture is both justified and necessary, because the worldly, aesthetic, and discursive coherence of white raciality is mutually dependent on the long historical production of multiple, violently oppressive, and dehumanizing totalities exploration, colonial national sovereignties, racial chattel property relations, patriarchal racial capitalism, racial colonial sexual violence, cultural and ecological expropriation, epistemological conquest, and so on. Here, I'm committed to a project that subjects white raciality to a leveling, that is, a critical re-narration against its own generalized terms of liberal, rational, teleological, self-valorization, progress, and global humanitarian humanist subjectivity. In this context, the contemporary moment of white reconstruction indexes a longer archive of white raciality that must be critically, relentlessly theorized and traced. Catherine McKittrick's archival dance with demons is instructive here as it moves on the otherworldly surfaces of black women's collective historical encounter with an unfathomable, unfathomable, through though persistently narrated, white racist anti-black misogyny. Read alongside Milian, her critical theory of method methodolo methodology expands and multiplies the temporalities and locations of epistemology as such. The de demonic invites a slightly different conceptual pathway while retaining its supernatural etymology and acts to identify a system, social, geographic, technological, that can only unfold and produce an outcome if of uncertainty or disorganization or something supernaturally demonic is integral to the methodology." End quote. McKittrick's, McKittrick's radical black feminist demonic ground form an altogether different conception of spatiality and geography, centering a genealogy of the historical spatial unrepresentability of black femininity in order to rethink human geography against the ways it has been conceived, inhabited, and reproduced through the regimes of white academic raciality. Spurred by Winner's unparalleled critique of Western humanism, McKittrick's methodology re reveals as it rejects the racial colonial power of white raciality, quote, man, end quote, as a both epistemological position and actively inhabited epistem epistemic project. Quote, Winter's demonic model serves to locate what she calls cognition outside the always non-arbitrary pre-prescribed, which underscores the ways in which the subaltern lives are not marginal or other to regulatory classificatory systems, but instead integral to them. This cognition, or demonic model, if we return to the non-deterministic scheme I described above, makes possible a different unfolding, one that does not replace or override or remain subordinate to the vantage point of man, but instead parallels his constitution and his master narratives of humanness. On the other side of the demonic is the archival mundaneness of evil, that is, man's evil.
This archivally mundane evil conditions and is actively produced in the ascendancy of white being and the oppressive covenings of white academic raciality. The critical archival labor can and must be undertaken on this other side, informed by the demon informed by the demonic as it tells stories of evil's origins, speculates about terror's genesis, and excavates the sinister thoughts lurking behind the smiling, smirking faces that re-articulate master narratives old and new. These archival engagements are guided by a counter-disciplinary insurgency against the coercive universality of Winter's European man, the genre of human being that is forcibly imposed on the rest of humanity as a universalized template for the species. Following Winter, the primary terms of any genealogy of white beings ascendancy must encompass the racial geography and paradigmatic power relation of the New World slave plantation, as well as the West's particular genre of human being, man. She writes, quote, The New World slave plantation is a dominant logic, and it's a specific cultural logic, but it is also an ethical logic a paradoxical real politic and a secular one that is in the process of emerging. It is the reasons of state, ethic, logic, ethic and logic that is going to bring in the modern world, what I call the millennium of man. We have lived the millennium of man in the last 500 years. And as the West is inventing man, the slave plantation is a central part of the entire mechanism by means of which that logic is working its way out. But that logic is total now, because to be the not man is to not is to be not quite human. Yet that plot, that slave plot on which the slave grew food for his and her substance, sus, substance subsistence, carried over a millennial other conception of the human to that of man's. End quote. In the raging internal antagonism of civilization, winter's ongoing millennium of man, there is an insurgent proto-revolutionary conception of the human that is inhabited, nourished, and collectively sustained by the enslaved. For winter, the enslaved, that is, incarcerated, deracinated, derac denigrated, captive Africans in the New World, produce modalities of communion, kinship, and physiological cultural reproduction via creative de genius that permanently disrupt man's colonial anti-black universalization. White reconstruction apprehends white academic raciality as a fiction that is simultaneously produced by and constitu constitutive of the epochal project of civilization, within which U.S. nation building is arguably the paradigm Stigmatic, paradigmatic, modern expression. In this sense, the most recent recent iteration of white reconstruction is new only in the sense that it marshals the post-apartheid technologies of racial liberalism, specifically the piecemeal, compulsory, and or disciplinary inclusion of non-normative bodies into normatively white supremacist, heteronormative institutional spaces in the service of sustaining the ascendancy of white being well into the 21st century. Eruption The dreadful genius of white reconstruction lurks in the creative, selective, temporary disruption of white bodily monopoly in the administration of the United States Nation Building Project, structured in the manifest dreams of global civilization. Changing institutional ensembles selectively re changing institutional ensembles selectively reconstitute personal and protocols under the ideological umbrellas of diversity, inclusion, equity, tolerance, and mutual respect. In doing so, there is a reassembly of long familiar relations of dominance, legitimated state terror, and misery making guided by the nation-building imperatives of gendered racial criminaliz criminalization, colonial occupation and displacement, and normalized domestic to global carceral war. Within this extended moment, the long relations of chattel, frontier, pat 
patriarchal and heteronormative violence thrive within a vexed racial common sense. White Reconstruction attempts to cultivate a counterdisciplinary intimacy with the historical violence of gendered anti-blackness and racial coloniality for the sake of contributing to dynamic and growing eruptions of critical, radical, and abolitionist praxis. The notion of eruption is multifaceted. In ecological terms, it references a sudden increase in an animal population within a specific geography as a result of migration or displacement. Somewhat more commonly, eruption, eruption suggests a forcible or violent intrusion, intrusion. The following pages are a study of and tribute to the spectrum of eruptions that defined the long half-century of white reconstruction. Eruptive surges of human movement, mobilization, and dispersal, collective radical creation and critique, and various formations of community within movements of insurgency and revolt are the constant rebuttals to the lasting cultural economic consequences of what Lewis Gordon names institutionalized dehumanization, and what Sadia Hartman, Zakia Iman Jackson, and others apprehend as the perpetual subjugation of black human being to the criminalizing violence, objection, and ontological vulnerabilities of the epochal chattel institution. Many of these eruptions seek the abolition and or revolutionary transformation of systematic immobilization and misery, prisons, defunded and police schools, militarized borders, and state-occupied streets and skies. Focused densely strategized and theorized praxis radically inhabits, invades, and infiltrates the carceral sites of white reconstruction, drawing from multiple wellsprings of decolonial sovereignty, black radical creativity, feminist organizing methods, and transformative queer rearticulations of place, body, and subjectivity, among other living traditions. Such are the primary indications of systematic and collectively experienced distress, that is, of white reconstruction as an ensemble of projects that attempt to normalize the antisociality of gendered, racialized, targeted people's differentiated, state-sanctioned, or extra-legal vulnerability to premature death. Each of this book's chapters attempts to address different related inhabit inhabitations of this historical present tense. The aftermath of U.S. apartheid's formal abolition has been overwhelmed by jur juridical and narrative national cultural vindication of, quote, civil rights as the vessel of fully actualized gendered racial citizenship. This fraud has fa facilitated rather than interrupted the expansion and proliferation of a domestic war, war raging regime. For the sake of momentary simplicity, consider the prevailing national narrative. The half-century legacy of civil rights victory rests on an always fragile but persistent common sense notion that na national political culture, quote, America, and reformist law and statecraft, let us call this the dream, have definitively, irreversibly endorsed official racial equality. Bound by this narrative political arc, the racist state's mechanics shift and multiply to rearticulate a condition of normalized, anti-black, racial colonial violence that is condoned or even applauded by the institutionalized regimes of civil rights. Under the terms of this political cultural regime, the early 21st century crises of racist state violence, from homicidal anti-black policing to the ecological toxification of indigenous and black ecologies, are not best understood as tragic deviations from an otherwise rights-respecting liberal sociality. Rather, such crises index how the post-1960 civil rights regime is entirely compatible with, if not directly complicit in, a still-emerging culture and statecraft of criminalization and proto-genocidal violence that affirms the nationalist dream of post-civil rights citizenship. The racial racist state is constantly called upon to legislate, 
protect and serve the civil rights citizen, even as it is the subject of militant demands for reform that will align it with the civil rights versions of America and the dream. This contradiction yields ever-increasing layers of gendered raci racist statecraft in the post-optimist's age of Obama-Trump. A growing archive of critical scholarship and journalism, as well as a diversity of civil society-based activisms, continually navigate the fallout of white reconstruction as if it is akin to an accumulating set of legal and civil violations ideological betrayals of the civil rights dream, or mean-spirited institutionalizations of suffering for otherwise innocent, queer, dark-skinned, and poor people. Critical scholars and teachers, non-profit and non-governmental -gover advocacy organizations, legal campaigns, and mass protest mobilizations energetically spread progressive discourses of social and economic justice, anti-racism, accountability for sexual violence, civil human rights protection and redemptive citizen personhood against the ugliness, abuse, and sickness that seem to perforate and puncture the dream. Yet there remains an overwhelming cultural and political insistence that the last half century is a time of generalized racial progress, even as proliferating spectacles of atrocity betray the omnipresence of unspectacular racial, colonial, anti-black violence across the American totality. In the pages that follow, I will attempt to contribute a theorized counter-narrative of the historical present tense that departs from such liberal progressive narratives and their various derivations. White Reconstruction fixates on the structural and symbolic rearrangements of gendered anti-blackness and racial colonial violence that have seemingly replaced prior classical models of institutionalized and state-formed racial dominance. Each chapter focuses on specific moments and texts in the long archives of anti-blackness, racial colonial dominance, and ascendant white being in order to analyze and explicate the largely under-theorized conditions of the contemporary iteration of the white reconstructionist dream. I intend for this critically scholarly labor to contribute to a deeper appreciation of the origins, methods, and radical creativity of the different forms of insurgent collective genius that galvanize within and against the deadly civilization experiment. Chapter 1. I Used Her Ashes, Multiculturalist White Supremacy, Counterinsurgency, and Domestic War, frames the critical study of white reconstruction in continuity with this introduction. Departing from a reflection on how critical scholarly work on the body and embodiment is redirected by Hortense Spiller's indispensable explication of blackness, gendered chattel, captivity, and flesh, the chapter considers the disrupted sociality of the body under conditions of anti-blackness and racial colonial power. Close attention to the nuances of Cedric Robinson's formation of racial capitalism provides a vital elaboration and extension of this critical framing and further contextualizes the analytical and theoretical method of this book. The chapter attempts to illustrate the implications of these critical theoretical structures by closely reading and counter-narrating counter the Los Angeles Police Department's Join LAPD Diversity Recruitment Initiative. Departing from a moment of black revolt against the normalized, jurid juridically sanctioned violence of the LAPD, the chapter concludes with a preliminary conceptualization of an abola abolitionist praxis that considers its anchoring in the black radical tradition while gesturing to its capacity to inform and influence the other liberationist visions. A dense history of gendered racial atrocity and unrecoverable loss is woven into the fabric of civilization and its ascendant modern national signifier, the United States of America. Generations, family trees, cultural communities, and ways of life are permanently altered and periodically liquidated through the mandated racial violence of American progress and hegemony. Yet, many of the most intensified and spectacular forms of U.S. racist state and state-sanctioned violence are narratively compartmentalized into bygone periods of land conquest, racial colonization, chattel slavery, and apartheid segregation. This discursive and historiographic, in fact, epistemic, 
compartmentalization constitutes another layer of man's violence and signifies the endurance of white academic raciality as a transparent origin point of hegemonic knowledge structures that persist well beyond their moments of inception. A radical reconsideration of the cultural and epistemological productions of anti-blackness and racial colonial dominance as the provenance of a tragic past is indispensable for the larger labor of addressing these genealogies of terror as part of historical present tense. Chapter 2, Let the Past Be Forgotten, Remaking White Being from Reconstruction to Pacification, attempts to build a critical gene genealogy that addresses white supremacy as a primary logic of racial power in its liberal, philanthropic, and reformist iterations. The chapter focuses on two geographically descended, but fundamentally related, moments in global white supremacy's living archive. Spanning the late 19th century to early 20th centuries, hmm. <laughs> the late 19th century testimonials called by the Freedmen's Bureau in the aftermath of the re reunited white nation's repression of black reconstruction and the earlier 20th century chronicling of U.S. colonial pass pacification and neocolonial nation build building in the Philippines. This meditation on turn of the 20th century white reconstructionist statecraft opens into a conception of white supremacy as a formation of power that traverses global circuits of trauma, fatality, and social disruption, each of which is central to, in fact, historically determinant of the present tense of civilization. I argue that the logic of anti-blackness and racial colonial violence form the conditions of white supremacist sociality, and thus comprise the ascendancy of white being within projects of racial reform as well as in liberal racial modernity more generally. At the time of this writing, national and global conversations about white nationalism and white supremacist population, populism and fasc fascism are anxious and widespread. The reactionary social dreams affirmed and institutionally empowered by the 2016 election of Donald Trump have provoked a spectrum of responses that demand a course correction of the racist state and revivified commitment to the ideological premises and promises of both America and the dream. Often ignored in, this, in the outraged din of responses to this nightmare of government, however, is the extensive evidence that such political ideological positions have historically functioned as the generalized framework through which respectable national political forms unfold. While Trumpism catalyzes and legitimates the reactionary white, overwhelmingly male and masculinist violence through various symbolic, state, and extra-state, as well as extra-legal methods, this moment of progressive white nationalism overlaps with prior periods of multiculturalist white supremacy that anticipate the emergence of contemporary post-racialism. Chapter 3, Goldwater's Tribal Tattoo, on origins and deletions of post-raciality, makes use of Silva's concept of raciality to define post-raciality as both an enabling condition of white reconstruction and the necessary preconditions for the articulation of early 21st century post-racial discourse. Here, post-raciality is the historical and discursive precedent for the 21st century post-racial pol political rubrics and social rhetorics. That is, post-raciality establishes the framework through which disavowals of racial dominance come to facilitate, rather than for forestall, repair, or prevent racist state and state condoned violence. I argue for a critical genealogy of post-raciality that relies on forms of creative, critical, speculative, archival, and narrative engagement that trace the intimate and public texts and make markings of white racial state figures. Here, exemplified by 1964 Republican presidential candidate and multiple-term U.S. Senator Barry Goldwater. This tracing, presented as a counter-narration of white beings disturbing, grating, morbidly, and unintentionally comedic and sometimes bizarre archival body, demystifies post-racial discourse while situating it within the longer continuities of racial dehumanization, anti-blackness, and logics of racial colonial genocide. 
To consider anti-black and racial colonial genocide as structuring logics of the post 1970s social order is to ignite collective debate, debate, reconsideration, and potentially substantial refiguring of left political commitments and agendas that understand themselves to be progressive, radical, transformative, revolutionary, or liberationist. White Reconstruction embraces counter-civilization readings of insurgent human, as well as extra and non-human, archives as a way of honoring the creativity endemic to the endangered practices of human being against the fatal ascendancy of white being. An analytical centering of anti-black and racial colonial genocide in the contemporary moment incites a critique of political vernaculars, activist paradigms, academic research agendas that may generate incisive rejoinders to the reformist logics of the white reconstruction period. From the National Urban League and the Civil Rights Congress to incarcerated Georgia and Pelican Bay prison strikers, there's a far-reaching body of scholarly writing, police reports, documentary film, grassroots publications, art, investigative journalism, editorials, organized protests, and other forms of knowledge production that address the institutional practices and normalized cultural structures of anti-black and racial colonial genocide. This living archive refutes the liberal American common sense that compartmentalizes the time of genocide to the distant past. To the contrary, the archive illuminates the multiple, complex forms that racial violence, social liquidation, and life curtailment have assumed in the descended aftermath of chattel, slavery, land, con- land conquest, and classical white supremacist nation, nation building. Chapter 4, Civilization and its Red and Waters, Anti-Black, Racial Colonial Genocide, and the Logic of Evisceration, reconsiders how the modern concept of genocide provides an incomplete rubric for apprehending the histori- historicity of gendered anti-blackness and racial colonial violence. Genocide, as a modern conceptual and jurisprudential formulation, is the impasse of the racial. To invoke its term already suggests exceptionality and absolute or abnormality, yet the formations of anti-blackness and racial colonial power in all their iterations rest on logics of the genocidal that collapse into regimes of normalcy, normativity, universality, and humanism, and sociality, civil society. In this sense, genocide is a discursive regime that invokes, but cannot fully engage, the layered historical violence of civilization as global order. Critically departing from the hegemonic legal, United Nations, and academic discourses on genocide, the chapter moves on to consider several examples of radical practice that appropriate and rearticulate gen- genocide discourse in confrontation with the fundamental, fatal violences of anti-blackness and racial colonial power. I argue that these genocide poetics not only reflect the ins- insufficiency of liberal progressive activists and jurid juridical rights-based vernaculars for communicating the everyday violence of anti-blackness and racial colonial dominance, but also inaugurate a critique of hegemonic human rights rhetoric. Genocide poetics can and must be rigorously engaged and critically appreciated as moments of artistry and creativity, where genocide is repurposed as a weaponized poetry of freedom-seeking insurrection and radical self-determination mobilized in an eruptive announcement of emergency against a state of normalcy. To think radically while thinking long historically requires constant recognition of how seemingly bygone, past tense violences continually shape the present and often reappear in the world as if they never left at all. Consider how those who who have differently inherited or survived the anti-black racial colonial past cannot escape its practices of power, including its languages, images, institutional legacies, and intertwining pathways of ecological, psychosocial, physiological, and communal damage. Such coerced heritages impose a political, intellectual, and ethical burden on scholarly activists, academics, artists, 
and creative cultural workers, journalists, independent scholars, legal professionals, teachers, students, and everyday critical thinkers of all kinds. The existing and or prevailing terms of critical, political, and cultural discourse must be analyzed, debated, and dynamically challenged in order to avert the pitfalls of white multiculturalist liberal appropriation. Chapter 5, Mass Incarceration as Misnomer, Domestic War and the Narratives of Carceral Reform, closely examines how mass incarceration has become an early 21st century keyword of shared grievance, national moral outrage, and liberal humanist alarm that simultaneously disavows and re-narrates anti-black carceral warfare. This chapter argues that such keywords distort and misapprehend the systematic violences cultivated in the gendered chattel colonial statecraft of the United States, while effectively displacing other scholarly, theoretical, and insurgent activist languages of revolt. As a phrase that invokes a sense of historical crisis, mass incarceration induces a multiculturalist liberal progressive coalescence that reifies reformist notions of unfairness, systematic bias, racial disparity, and institutional dysfunction. Under the fraudulent terms of an emergent national narrative, the fallout, misery, and asymmetrical casualties of domestic war can be resolved and repaired through vigorous internal auditing, aggressive legal and policy shifts, and rearrangements of carceral, juridical, and policing infrastructure. The chapter contends that such reformist measures reproduce, and ultimately enhance, the tactics and technologies of gendered racist criminalization, police occupation, and human capture that constitute the militarized cultural, juridical, and institutional infrastructures of domestic warfare. Thus, the temporary narrative of of mass incarceration endorses an intensification of policing as both a premise and a method of carceral reform. Carceral reform? Finally, the epilogue, Abolitionist Imperatives, departs from a historical mandate that conceptualizes the abolition as a creative, imaginative, speculative, collective labor grounded in black radicalism and its speculative practice, praxis. As it builds, solicits, 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 and urges collective labors towards a radical departure from the delimited political horizons imposed by white reconstruction, abolitionist praxis is invigorated by creativities of struggle, provoke, revolt, and communities that seek the end of white beings' ascendancy and the liberation and revitalization of incarcerated, displaced, occupied, criminalized, and oppressed people's existence as such and beyond. While the first five chapters explicate white reconstruction as an ensemble of cultural and political projects, narrative structures, ideologically, ideological tendencies, <clears throat> and state formations. My voice is cracking. In a minute. <clears throat> okay. 